everybody. And uh, somehow, you know, you do these write-ups months and months in advance, and something got me really excited, I guess. I don't know, I felt uh, a certain level of, um, I don't know exactly, because now as I sit down before you and start to talk about sex, drugs, gurus, and everything yoga, it's pretty kind of um, a big, many big topics there. Um, the truth is that I have practiced for something like, I started practicing yoga in 1978. I started teaching in spring of 19, well, actually in the summer of 1980. So I've been at this a long time, and my experience might be fairly unique. I think it's relatively unique given how much yoga has grown over the last 30 years and the way it's grown. And so before I'm done, I kind of, I want to take this opportunity. And by the way, thank you Wonderlust and uh, for the honor of, of, of giving this honor of speaking today. And also thank you all for coming. Um, but to just do what I can in a way to make sure that there is a, some voice heard in the you know, cacophony of many yoga voices. And I think these are some of the more kind of critical topics, whether or not we ask, them, or ask ourselves about these topics or we just indulge in them or we reject them or whatever we're wrestling with. I thought maybe it'd be worthwhile to talk about them a little bit. So the first thing, let's just get it out in the open. The sex and the drugs and the gurus and everything yoga, they have something in common. And what they have in common is the search for happiness. You know, they, they're all about finding or tasting something exquisitely most wonderful and exotic and glorious and fantastic and meaningful and inspiring. In fact, that search, the yoga tradition tells us, is what the purpose of our life is. So whether we're searching out yoga or we're longing to have sex again or we're looking for a guru or we're doing yoga or we're zip lining or we're climbing the side of a mountain or we're on the edge of someone's feet uh, being flown, you know what I'm talking about? Yoga style. I walked by the gazebo. Did you see that little festival going on in that space? All of these things, and really all of our life is a search for beauty and exquisiteness and joy and meaning. And to somehow get connected with this innate, deep, profound, sublime potential that sits in the seat of everyone's soul. The yoga tradition says that's our purpose, is actually to discover it. And so it's no wonder that we pursue it, and we pursue it in all of these myriad of ways. Yoga today is kind of, uh, a lot of it, at least in the Western world, is about kind of finding all of, these, all of these things that are relatively familiar in which we think or believe that if we do something and combine it with yoga, it can't be bad. In fact, it can only be great. Do something I really like and combine it with yoga. And so then you have, you know, you have the plethora of the yoga and, uh, you know what I'm saying by yoga and? So now we combine yoga with something. So my background is, you know, it's kind of like an interesting thing to experience because my background's a, a very traditional background. I actually was raised uh, for lack of a better word, I was raised in a discipleship mode, like old school, in which my teacher was a master, and his teacher was a master, and his teacher's teacher was a master. And what do I mean by master is they reach the end of that search that I was talking about earlier. They reach the end of the search of knowing what the purpose of life was. And that experience of this ultimate joy that you and I search out, they had found the end of it. And they transferred that experience and that knowledge to their student, and that's, that they became a master. And they transferred it to their student, and they transferred it to their student. And you can really go back, it's really unimportant in terms of time, but certainly thousands of years to find these lineages that, in which this um, achievement of human potential was found, was, was found, was established, where they did experience it. The yogis describe it, the tantrics particularly, they describe it as satyam, sundyam, and shivam. It's, shivam means auspiciousness. It means this place where really all happiness and success unfolds from. Sundyam means beauty. And satyam means at the heart of existence itself. This is what they knew. So I grew up in this background. 
And the thing is, that what I would suggest to all of us, and I think it's a critical kind of landing point for this talk, is that, you know, you don't have to come to yoga very long before you start hearing that your essence is beauty, and your essence is sublime, and your, all suffering ends when you know your essence. This is what we're told over and over again. One of the most affirming messages I got early on that inspired me to do yoga was, you don't have to create anything. What you do is you have to remove the obstacles to seeing who you are. And once you see who you are, this satyam, shivam, sundyam unfolds. The thing that we need to talk about, though, is the fact that we've all heard about it, but how many of us have actually experienced it? Well, I won't have to do a show of hands today, but how many of us have actually experienced it? So many of us are doing yoga, and that's a fantastic thing, because we have to, if, we're, if we have any hope of getting to the end of the journey, we have to start. We have to start the journey. We have to start it from where we are. But the point I really want to make is that we hear about the soul, we hear about divinity, we hear about the sacred, but how many of us know it? The silence is appropriate, right? The silence is the kind of, not yet. I want to, but not yet. So here's what I would say, and really I think, again, this is the setup for this talk, and I'll get to the hot and sensual part soon. I know that's why you came today. <laughs> um, is if we haven't yet gotten to it, if we don't yet know it, it means that we can't exactly know how to get there. Because if you and I knew how to get there, we'd be there already. If human beings knew how to taste their soul and knew how to taste it, they would, they would already be there. And so what that means is that we're really walking, it's a journey into the unknown. If you and I are only willing to dabble in the known, then we'll never get there. This is the critical piece, and this is the role of a teacher. A big question comes about, do I need a teacher? And I would just say it just depends. Depends about your ambition. What's your goal? Is your goal to handstand in the middle of the room? I don't think you really need a guru for a handstand in the middle of the room. You just need a good a yogi who's well-trained in alignment and who's encouraging and positive and forthcoming and gives you instruction. If your goal is to learn how to hold your breath comfortably, that's a little trickier, but still, I'm not sure that you really need a guru. So, the word guru, most of you know, I think, means one who removes darkness and gives light. One who removes darkness gives light. So, I'm going to begin to make this distinction right now about the, these two ideas. Guru, one who is really, has experienced the end of the journey of yoga, and one who's an instructor slash teacher, who can teach us an array of things. So I, I'm going to tell you a little story. I don't think I've ever spoken about this story out loud. When I was in, certainly not in the teaching atmosphere, when I was in ninth grade, first year of high school, I had an English teacher. And you know, I was, how old was I? I was 14 or 13 or something like that. So have you met any 13-year-old boys lately? Have you ever seen anybody? So I was a pretty fairly, typ fairly typical 13-year-old boy, at least in some ways. And this English teacher was the hottest woman I'd ever seen. <laughs> to the point where when we would have to write in her English class, I would just stare. And every time she saw me staring, I would put my head down, but I would just stare. I, I, and there was... Really, a, this is complete, has nothing to do with the talk, although maybe it does because I put sex as the first word. For the final, where we had to actually write, she wore a, and this, by the way, don't forget, this was 19, when was this? Uh, 72. She wore a fishnet um, top <laughs> with no brassiere. I got a D on this final <laughs> because the whole time I was just looking at her, her top, basically. <laughs> now, 
here's, here's the interesting thing. And as it relates to teacher, she didn't have to be a perfect person to teach me English. In fact, it was actually it winds up being a very tragic story. I don't know I'm in this weird mood today, so forgive me. She could teach me English, although I was way too distracted to learn much English or grammar from her. But she could teach me English. Why? Because she knew syntax and she knew grammar and she knew she. I, I, Assume she was fairly bright. I don't know. No, I didn't get past the uh, fishnet top. Frankly. <laughs> but it turns out, a couple years after I left high school, five years, that through high school, she had been having an affair with one of the other teachers who was married. And the tragedy was that while they were out carrying on in their affair, um, they got into a car accident and she was killed and um, he was badly injured. Now, why I tell you that story only to say, like, you know, the fact that she was who she was and the fact that this was going on behind the scenes was unimportant to me as a student, uh, as an English student. Someone who was, in fact, imperfect, you know, very much so. And I don't know what got into her to wear a fishnet top on the final day of the final with 13-year-old boys sitting in the room. But she could teach me English. And what I would say is that the first thing to understand about if you ever are going to consider a guru, it has to be someone whom has become purified in their heart and mind. Has to be. I watched in the yoga community about the last couple of years as some really big stuff happened, really rocked the yoga world. And it created at the end of that whole cycle just a lot of disillusionment about teacher, about who the teacher was, about do I need a teacher, and that teacher is just a crutch, and that if I depend on someone outside of me, that's absolutely the wrong thing. It's so counterintuitive. And yet I would say that all the signs were there. If you fell in love with a teacher who themselves was not yet perfect, you found the wrong teacher. You get the teacher you deserve. So the moment you start seeing your teacher doing shots of tequila, it's not a good sign you haven't found the right teacher. And it doesn't mean, again, this is what I'm saying, and, and the teachings are very clear about this. It, you, you can learn natural science from anybody. You can learn astrology from anyone who knows what they're talking about. But can you learn the heart of yoga from someone who doesn't yet embody it? In this same kind of dialogue around evolution, there's this whole notion of opening the heart heard this and heard this and heard this. Let me tell you something, and this is a kind of little more secret, little hidden teaching in Tantra. Opening your heart doesn't happen when you do backbends. Opening your heart is a process, and I'll leave that, I'll, I'll leave the process a little in the mystery for the time being, but here's how you know it's actually happened. According to the teachings, someone's heart is open, when they have control of their lower impulses. That's what we should know. Someone's heart is open, and why? Because according to the tradition, there's a thousand times more shakti, that, mean, that word means power or capacity. There's a thousand times more energy in your heart there, than there is in your lower chakras. And the lower chakras, by the way, for those of you not familiar with this kind of terrain, that's where our lower impulses come from. So fundamentally, fear, the search and longing for power, control of others, our, sensu our sensuality, our desires. And I'm not saying in any way to deny desire, but I'm saying to be able to uh, not be at the mercy of your desires is really critical. So if you're going to pick a teacher, make sure you're picking one who, in fact, embodies it. Here's what I would tell you. Pick a teacher first by seeing who they are. Later, listen to what they're saying. The first thing to do is to see who they are, then begin to listen. If you pay attention to listening, well, you know, there's a lot of really good speechifiers. Great speech, you know, great and interesting dialogue can come out of academics, yogis. This philosophy is so flowery and so interesting on so many levels. I think deep down it touches most of us very deeply. But the, the talk is much less important than the embodiment.
So depending on your ambition, if you want to be, if you want to get to the end of the journey, you need the light, you need the guidance, you need the living example of someone who has at least gotten close to the end of the journey, if not already fully at the end of the journey. Certainly someone who's much further along than we are. And so the idea of Guru really is, if you want to get to the end, you need to step into the unknown and you need uncharted territory. You're going to walk into uncharted territory to get there. And thus you need someone who's already been in that uncharted territory. The drugs thing is, um, I guess I'm saving the best for last. The drugs things is interesting. I had my, I, in my early years, and my teenagers did some of that stuff. Not long after I discovered yoga, though, it began to fall away. And I was curious because, you know, if you go into a very traditional text called the Yoga Sutras, right there at the end of the fourth chapter, beginning of the fourth chapter, he mentions that there are four ways in. He mentions there's the way of birth, which, by the way, I'm sure no one here, you were born enlightened, otherwise you wouldn't be at this talk, you know, you'd be doing something else. Um, Right. And, um, and one of the four, he also mentions, he mentions drugs. Drugs can get you there. And um, a commentary I read on that sutra suggested that the technology of drugs to do it, and by the way, it was a very technical process. It actually worked with the stars, astrological cycles, the cycle of the moon, your Ayurvedic constitution, specific dosages, when you would do it, how you would do it, and exactly under what you would do when you were doing drugs. So it was a very specific, detailed process. This wasn't like getting high and going to the movies, okay? <laughs> so this was deeply technology, you know, it was a profound technology or methodology. And I saw this commentary that said a thousand years ago, the sages saw that it was being misused and they destroyed the technology. And I wanted, I was curious because I wanted to ask my teacher about it. And he confirmed that and said, yeah, indeed, that's true. So even that technique, now you go to India, some of you maybe have been to India and you see these Nagasadhus, you see these, um, they're naked except for at, you know, they wear a lot of ash. If, they're, if they have a little more money, they have a trident. You've seen any of these guys? Any of you guys been to India and see the Nagasadhus? And they are getting stoned around the clock. And a lot of Westerners have come back, and as a result of seeing these Nagasadhus with dreadlocks and with ash, they now wear dreadlocks and are looking for the ash. But in the meantime, they're getting stoned too. And the truth is that, you know, in India, just because you wear Swami clothes doesn't mean you're at the end of the journey. Some people may be in, at the front of the journey. Very, very, very front in the journey. In fact, you know, if you are a sadhu and you belong to a certain ashram, you get fed. And that may be some person's main motivation, is just to get one meal a day. And meanwhile, the ashram not only gives you a meal, but also gives you as much of the weed as you want. And somehow these ashrams, that where the Naga sadhus hang out, have this <clears throat> unwritten, it's unwritten, it's legally unwritten, it's not official, but the Indian government lets them smoke weed. So here's the thing about yoga. Does that make sense in a yogic world? Does it really make sense? Again, what is your ambition? Here's the thing. We all want to feel good. But what I would say is that there really is no place for drugs and, and um, yoga. Why? Because this is a game of perception. The yoga game is a game of perception. You have all the equipment, all of us do, each of us, all the equipment that Buddha had. He had nothing on you. Jesus Christ, nothing on you. Same innate capacities, your instrument is exactly the same. What makes a Buddha a Buddha is his perception, his ability to see into the invisible. His ability to recognize what you and I don't see. The only difference between one who is awake and one who isn't, one who sees the eternal in everything, one who sees the infinite, and one who sees the finite, it's a perception game because the infinite's here. 
And the thing about drugs is that when we use them, it shifts perception. And for a short period of time, it shifts perception in a fairly likable way. Right? People wouldn't do it if it didn't feel good. We're looking for the desire. We're looking to, for the glory. We're looking for the peace. This is part of your life's purpose. But that distortion of perception does more than simply handicap your perception for a while. Let me, the, the thought I have around this is this. If drugs were so great, why doesn't the Dalai Lama do it? If drugs are so great, why doesn't someone just, one of his disciples say, you know, your, your holiness, I know you're doing great. Your three to four hours of meditation every day are really, you know, you're a very compassionate man. Clearly you walk with the Buddha in your soul. I hope I'm not being sacrilegious here. I don't want, I don't tend to be. Why don't you try weed? It would be even better. The reason we don't do that is because we know the Buddha, or we know the holy, the, His Holiness, is already in contact with the higher reality. The only reason that even weed, something that seems fairly innocuous to most of us, and culturally is very innocuous, I mean, it's something that's pretty widely done and accepted in the yoga world, the reason it feels good is because we don't feel good. That's a strong statement. The reason it feels good is because we don't feel good. If we did, and when I say good, you know what I'm talking about. I'm talking about seeing reality. If we are actually living with the sacred in our heart, we don't want in any way to distort that awareness, which is what exactly what drugs do. So this notion of... You know, it's not a big deal. I'll use pot. It's, it's, it really a, it's really, on the one hand, we get hooked by it because we do, we're on, the same, we're on the same path as people who are ultimately searching out yoga to find their deepest meaning. It's the same path that anyone is looking for through all of their activities, as I said. Cross the board, whether it's gardening or dancing or making love or listening to music or the pride that we take with our iPhone. There's something there. There's some kind of innate joy that we search out through life. But what I'm saying is that if we want to taste the ultimate version of it, we need, as, we need our perception to be as clear as possible. Absolutely as clear as possible. And once again, it's unknown territory. It's unknown. There's nothing in our culture that teaches us tells us, shows us the way into the unknown. The unknown parts of me are like deeply held secrets behind the golden doors to your heart. So, um, you know, I, I would encourage anyone who seriously is pursuing yoga and really deep in their heart is willing to make this courageous commitment to the unknown is to learn to do things as simple as give up habits that aren't good for you. Really, that aren't good for you. Just something as simple as that is a, is a very powerful place to begin this process. Um, I do have a few more thoughts and then maybe we'll have some time for um, some question. I've actually covered a lot of ground that I wanted to talk today about. Um, I realize what I'm saying is a little bit counterculture, and I, driving up here to Whistler, I was thinking, do I want to create controversy? You know, do I want to kind of blow people's um, balloon here? Do I want to pop the balloon? And, um, and I guess the answer was yes, I do. And really, the intention of this is just that we can continue to evolve. You know, let's not forget that yoga is new in America. This is a totally wild experiment. There's nothing like wanderlust anywhere in the world, you know. Although they will be everywhere in the world pretty soon. Uh, but this is new. It couldn't have happened 10 years ago. It couldn't have happened 20 years ago. When I started yoga, oh my God, there was like five yoga teachers in Los Angeles. Now that you, when you go to a restaurant, there's five yoga teachers at the table next to you. <laughs> so we're... This is a very new arc. This is an incredibly new experiment. And all I really want to do is really just lend 
contribute to the conversation around what is possible. The Upanishads, the, the Tantras, the Vedas, the teachings of Advaita Vedanta are so profound, so rich. They have, resting in these ancient teachings, is such amazing knowledge about how to make a human being into a spiritual being. I don't mind innovation. I really don't mind it, per se. It's just when there's innovation without looking back and without somehow getting connected to the experiments that happened over thousands of years. The teachings got refined over thousands of years. And innovation is wonderful if you use really the ancient wisdom that came long ago that is the true foundation of ultimately accomplishing what this practice is all about. So I would, I would just invite you to seek out those extremely few individuals who have a link to that ancient wisdom. There's not a lot. And I, you know, I often ask myself, why isn't there so many? And then as you, maybe as you already have an answer to that, as you're starting to hear my talk, this sounds hard. It sounds challenging. It sounds like a big commitment. And then I have to give up my pot smoking too? Screw it, I'll just do something more fun. It just takes a lot, there's a lot to it. But if you doubted what I said about Buddha and you, you know, the, 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 the parallel, the, the common capacities that you both have, and you think, well, Buddha was fated to be enlightened. You know, that's the story. Then you say, well, even if he was fated, do you know how much practice he did? Do you have any idea the level of intensity in his practice? Mind-blowing. Mind-blowing practice. I mean, right at the end there, you know, for him to sit for 39 days in meditation. Are you kidding? Non-stop? So, it's waiting. We can all wake up. We can all wake up but we're going to have to step into uncharted territory. And I invite you to be courageous. I invite you to look to the ancient tradition. And just because something comes easy and it feels good doesn't mean it's going to help you reach the final destination. That's all. Um, I would ask you to just be, look at how you can best prepare yourself how you best can, how would I put it, how you can fulfill the purpose of your life. In short, what is the purpose of human life? It's to do what is unique to you. The one thing, and I'm, I love animals, so don't get me wrong, but we do have a few things that animals don't have. And one is the ability to sit straight, spine in line, top of the head over the base of our spine, and we can reflect on the depth of consciousness. We can actually reflect on it. What makes you unique is the determinant around what you're here to do. Lions use all of their capacities. Tigers, bears, snails, slugs, fish, dolphins, they use all of their capacities. As human beings, the only way we can fulfill our purpose is if we use all of our capacities. And that one thing is it. This one thing is the critical piece. This idea of being able to taste your own essence. Right before I got here, a um, friend slash magazine publisher asked me to give her a BAM, B-A-M, BAM in caps, a BAM quote. So I'm thinking BAM quotes on the way over here. I haven't given her a BAM quote yet. <laughs> so what's the BAM quote for this talk? The BAM quote is, stop your noise, drop your bad habits, pursue the one who's calling you in your heart. 
and let go of everything that stands in the way. Make that your life purpose. And you will get to the end of the yoga destination. And find the one who knows. Find the one who's seen it. Find the one who tastes it. See your teachers. Before you, you know, if you're gonna if you're gonna do this guru thing, first, I don't know, I don't think there's ten in the United States. I don't think there's five, to be honest with you. It's really a small number. And I get around, but it's a really small number. And before you pay attention to how elo eloquent they are, pay attention to who they are. Look around at their students. Do their students shine? Do their students seem to be more present than you are? Or that, do they somehow show up in a way that you would like to show up? Did I cover all the BAM statements? I think so, close to that. So um, I've got the last thing, for, best thing here. And, and you, know, you notice, I, I haven't looked at my notes very much during this talk, but I, do, I did come with notes. I've covered them. And then on the last page here, can anyone see my notes here? So it says sex, don't. <laughs> that means don't have sex with your students and don't have sex with your teachers. There's nothing good about it. What I try and tell my students is, there is no question that if you're a teacher, someone's gonna fall in love with you. You might not be nice, you may not be hot, you may not be cool, you may not be, but just the fact that you are you're the vehicle that's providing this yoga thing, it's called transference in psychological circles. Boom, someone will fall in love with you, no doubt about it. Absolutely a nightmare to take advantage of that. In fact, the teachings say that every action we do, this is important, every action we do has karmic effect. Every action. And it's stored in what they call a karmic pouch, called karmashaya. So every action we do is stored in this pouch, which sooner or later will bear fruit. But it says that there's a select few things that bear fruit right away. And, the, and one of those things is taking advantage of someone who trusts you. So it's, it has consequences to both the person who has trusted the teacher and the teacher themselves. One of the things that will instantly affect your destiny is taking advantage of someone who trusts you. So, and the thing I tell my teachers is, look, once you create a personal or romantic relationship with a student, they can never be your student again. They can't, that's impossible. Even if you have the best intentions, that's not possible. Once it's crossed that barrier of line between teacher and student, it's now become something else. Why not, just, why not just keep as many students as you can? <laughs> you know? It's a rare find when a teacher finds, a student finds someone they can trust. So why not just preserve it? And um, you know, it, this really has to do with intention and you know, what in the end do you wanna have as your legacy? And it's better to be frustrated as a human being, as a man or as a woman. It's better to have that unsatisfied want than it is to indulge it. In fact, that unsatisfied want, you can actually follow it to what? To that innate desire for satyam, sundiyam, and shiva. Even the desire, lust itself, is still a longing to know the infinite. And if we don't suppress or repress our sexuality, but just remember what it's arising from. It's arising from the hunger to know ourselves. And then you can begin, if you do the real work of opening your heart, you won't have to fight those urges so much. You'll feel them, you'll see them, but they don't have the sway over you because the power of your heart is bigger than the power of the, those lower impulses. And it can still be there, the desire can still be there, but it's not overwhelming. And certainly doesn't lead you to take actions that have, will have negative repercussions both for you and your students. Terms of out in the open and not, I mean, in terms of 
having sex without people who aren't your students or people who aren't your teacher. There's no rules on that. Just be nice. <laughs> Just be nice. And, um, you know, in the end, it's just about seeing the sacred in everything. This, is, this whole dance is sacred. It's just a sacred dance. And this idea of separateness is really a mistake. We're not separate. We're one. And the less invested we are in our version of who we are, the more we can expand it, our, our vision of what life is, then not only will we feel that we're making progress in our own spiritual journey, but we will bring more glory to creation itself. We will be enlivened. So, in conclusion, I don't, I don't want to sit idly by and let yoga, yogis believe that, yo, that drugs are not destructive. They are. Alcohol, by the way, is a drug. Can you have a glass of wine from once in a while? Why not? My first teacher actually was very clear that weed, is that what you guys, is that what it's called these days? Is that what it's called? I don't know, it's like 30 years since I smoked. Is it called, what's it called? BC Bud. Oh, BC Bud, okay. Well, this is really a north of the border kind of thing. Bud, okay, we'll just call it Bud. With pot, pot, even pot, they call it pot. So, um, it just, I, I'm just not going to sit idly by and pretend that it's not destructive. If you feel good, you don't have an urge for it. If you feel good enough, if you see the divine, you won't seek it out. That's simple. And if you're not, if it's a struggle for you, well, there's, there's programs for that. But if it's really just a matter of preference in your mind, just fi figure out, create a, a strategy for life called meditation where, yeah, by the way, where you are tasting the infinite and begin to venture alone in your relationship to it. Walk into that relationship willing to deal with the hardship of that, of like, uh, of not indulging in those distractions. Okay, and then teacher is worth having if you find the right one and if, you're, if you exercise discretion. And uh, for those of us who are really hungry to get to the end of this path, and there is an end. I know that sounds very dualistic, um, but you and I use cell phones. We're pretty dualistic. All right, if you could just call anybody and say, hey, what's happening? And they'll say, I haven't talked to you in eight years. Why are you calling me? So, well, I'm just in a non-dualistic mode, and I thought I'd call anyone and just say, hey, what are you doing tomorrow night? But the last time, anyway, you know what I mean? We are in a dualistic world. You make sure you, you text the right person. Have we learned that lesson? Where you put a name in there and you text it, you go, holy sh It's absolutely the wrong person to tell that you, you, you know, whatever you said. So that's called duality. I'm sure I've disappointed you with this title. <laughs> There's no way I could live up to sex, drugs, and rock and roll and gurus. But I try to cover the important things. So do we have time for a couple of questions? Definitely. Yeah. If you do have questions, we just ask that you use the microphone so that everyone can hear it and the yeah. camera. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Does anyone have a question? <laughs> Someone's coming down. Oh, I think into the oh, mic, though. Right, they need to do that. Um, okay, well, now that I'm here. So you mentioned that there's three things in this karmic pouch. I'm curious yeah. what the other two things are that bear fruit, or actions that bear fruit. Oh, 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 immediately? So these are obviously negative karmas, by the way. So um, I'm testing my memory here. Sorry. Uh, no, that's all right. So the other one is, actually, it's pretty interesting. Another one is somehow... Taking money from a miser is actually mentioned. And I, I've forgotten the last two. The other two, the other side of the equation is 
good karmas, serving a sage is one. Instantly bears fruit. And the other one that stands out in my memory, because there's also four on each side that bear instant fruit, is mantra. Mantra practice bears instant fruit, they say. Yeah, yeah. Thank thanks. thanks. Anyone else? Any arguments? I'm just cringing. Someone has a question. Hi. Hi, thank you. Um, I have a question. Suppose somebody who's relatively young, in their 20s or 30s or 40s, they're seeking fulfillment. They're seeking to bring some light into their lives. But they have a, a routine in their life where they have to wake up and go to work every morning. And um, let's say they're a business person and they have to meet clients. And to be able to be social with their clients or with their friends, there's drinking involved and there's there's partying involved and there's fun. That's all part of their lifestyle and it's also part of their career. Mm -hmm. What would you say to that person who is trying to begin the journey but is not quite ready to give up the attachment to um, these things that you call destructive? Do you think, would you say that they should even start some of the elements of the journey or just prolong it or just wait until they reach a later point in their life? Um, no, that's a great question. Question um, is actually a relevant one because I, I kind of tail tailored this conversation to those of you who've been practicing and who it's a significant part of your life. They must start. And even if it's three minutes a day of prayer. You know, uh, ha having taught as long as I have and having these uh, tremendous teachers with access to amazing practices, I can tell you that one of the most powerful things to do is simply sit up and contemplate why you're here. Who am I? What's the purpose of my life? And just to do that every day, just to sit up. And those of you who have a meditation practice, before you start doing pranayama and all of these intricate things, just take that moment, settle down, and just say, what's important? Who am I and what's important? And if you just do that three minutes, literally, just contemplate on those simple questions. Who am I? What's most important? What deep, deep in my heart what does my heart of hearts really want? That already starts to, let's say, germinate that seed that is the flower of self-awareness, self-realization. So that's what I would say, is just begin wherever you are. Um, and you know, it's important that we remember, because uh, the last part of your question was actually really, really vital, and that is, do you wait? Don't wait. In fact, if you're still using pot and you don't agree with me, keep using pot, but keep practicing. Seriously, don't wait. The fact is, as I look around this room, most of you are barely, not even really in the middle age yet. It's a fairly young group, youngish. Some of you are kind of working toward my end of the spectrum. Uh, I'm 50, how old am I? 56. So, um, so that, yeah, middle age, you know, middle age plus. Um, but this is the time. This is the time. You know, if you start in your 80s when you realize, oh man, all that drinking and business and business meetings, you're not going to have anything left. Suddenly at 80, you're going to be trying to sit up and, and do some of these things that if you're going to in any way make some huge or significant dent, it's going to be too late. You won't have the prana. You won't have the capacity. You won't have the shakti. Um, and the other thing is, you know, I, I, we get in momentum. We get into a momentum in life. And it's hard not to be in a momentum. A momentum of the way we think about ourselves, a momentum, momentum relative to work, momentum relative to how much love and time do we make, give to our family, a momentum of, you, you name it. Really, our yoga is typically a momentum thing. It worked two years ago, so I'm still doing it now. It's vital that we just take a moment and say, hey, I'm in the field of, as you described in this person's life, you know, I'm in the field of this. Is this really helping me? In the end, for me personally, and now I'll speak for me, for myself on this, this question around um, shaping a life is I'm unwilling to let my life, and by the way, I have four children, I have a wife, I have a business, I have many, many students. I'm unwilling to let the obligations in my life overshadow the purpose of my life. That's the central piece. Now, is my purpose to be a good dad and, you know, uh, 
uh, a businessman or whatnot with integrity and those things, yeah, that's part of my purpose. But my ultimate purpose is to um, meet the divine. That's it. Rest in the divine's heart. Rest in her hands and let her rest in my lap. That's it. If I can do that, then I've, I've fulfilled my journey and I'll be done. So I'd say start. Start with something very simple, three minutes. And just the person should ask themselves, what do I want? Who's inside of there? What do I need to do to pay attention and honor them? And that's it. And then if nothing else, they should get my Yoga Nidra CD. <laughs> Plug. Um, which they can do lying in bed, even slightly hungover. <laughs> I don't know how it works with a hangover. I've never done it. But um, this is, I mean, if you haven't discovered Yoga Nidra, this is one of the great tools of yogic science where you don't have to even know asana. You can just lay down and totally balance all the systems of the body and the mind. And uh, so, yeah, they should do something. Any last questions? Come on, you guys. We didn't talk enough about sex, did we? Okay, here's one more. No, okay, cool. Sex. Oh, all right. Um, and I understand if you don't feel comfortable answering, but what about if you're prescribed drugs from your doctor that are actually altering your... Are you talking about like antidepressants? Yeah. Yeah. Um, thank you for asking, and I'm glad I can actually speak to that because I do think there's a place for them. And um, they're different. Really what I was alluding to was recreational use of hallucinogenics. That seems to be, you know, and I don't know what cocaine is. I, I see, you know, what's weird is I still am, I'm, I find it almost unbelievable that people still do this stuff. I really do. I, part of me goes, people in their 50s are still doing drugs? Really? You haven't outgrown that yet? I, mean, I knew high school, that was cool. And the first couple of years of college, that was cool. But after you gave up your college days, doesn't it happen? Something happened. So... But in terms of antidepressants and drugs, let's be clear um, about it. Because it's, it's actually a longer conversation, but I want to just try and address it head on. Which is that there are certain neurological conditions where these are wonderful tools. Where they bring the person to a baseline and allow them to function well. Then what I would say, and again, this is a very short answer to a very important question, and very relevant. Given, given what's happening in society today, then what they do is they allow us, if we reach a baseline, then they allow us to begin to work forward and perhaps begin to break down the sources of the depression. In some cases, there won't be a psychological reason. It's purely neurological. These are, you know, you don't, just someone doesn't have the same neuropeptides firing and moving through the system as other people do. I would also go, I would also s just address the opposite side, which is I do think they're overprescribed, but there is a role for them. And just like any form of technology that makes our life better today, there is a place for them. I don't have judgment on them being used uh, for the right person at the right time. And depending on the conditions that are prevalent, in them, encouraging them to move through a process of maybe one day not needing them. On the other hand, I've worked with people who have been on antidepressants and I, in some cases, they did slowly wean off with the directions under the supervision of a, a, a doctor, psychiatrist, along with doing meditation and practices, yogic practices. And in other cases, there wasn't even a goal to wean them off. Of it. it was just to bring yoga as a spiritual element into their life. So I do think there's a place for them. I do think, there's a, uh, uh, I do think they're overprescribed. The one thing I would suggest is that, I, I mean, that if I, had, if I could contribute my part of this into this discussion, I would just say that for those whom, uh, whom it applies, it's ideal if it's not a permanent solution. Now, some people will need it, as I said, but if it's a way to create a foundation for people then to begin to process out of the depression, that's a, that's a fantastic thing. 
I'd say that's Tantra. That's using a modern methodology to help the person expand and find freedom. Okay, thanks for asking that question. Anything else? Last one, guys, one more. We're all good? So you got the message? You're gonna go out partying tonight? And <laughs> standing on your head, doing shots, going up the stairs, in handstand. <laughs> with your teacher on the top of your feet. <laughs> Don't do it. So, you know what, I just, uh, I'll end just by saying, keep practicing, practice is the teacher. And ultimately, if you're graced enough to find the teacher, there is no difference between the teacher and the teachings. The illuminative part of the teacher, excuse me, the illuminative part of the teachings themselves is the teacher in form. And ultimately, what's more important than having a teacher is having contact with this essence of the teachings. What these teachings were meant to bring us to is what this game is about. The teacher is less important than the teachings, but ultimately the teacher is the embodiment of what those teachings are meant to lead us to. So keep practicing. The teacher is the practice and keep evolving. Thank you. <laughs>